It's known to be one of the best hotels on earth. But does it live up to its reputation for incredible service and out of this world food? Hi there, my name is Kevin. This channel came from a love of traveling, a love of the full process and the journey itself. I feature airline trip reports and high-end hotel reviews from all over the world. My reviews aren't sponsored by airlines or hotels, so you can be sure to get my unbiased opinion. Am I an expert? You can decide. Am I fair? Yeah, I am. Let's get into it. Welcome to Mumbai. The Oberoi Mumbai is known to be one of their flagships of the Oberoi brand and redefined what a business hotel was or could be in the 1980s. If you'd like to know the exact rate that I paid for my stay or my next five videos in queue, please check out the description below. I'm not really gonna go into detail about it in this video, but security at this hotel and many other hotels in India is very tight following the terrorist attacks of 2008. This has led me to needing to adapt my style in filming in India to be even more discreet than I normally am and to be respectful of the procedures that are in place. So you might see a little bit of a different style. The main entrance to the hotel now, built in 1986, is from the side street and brings you into a small receiving lobby, which gives you access to its 287 rooms. The Oberoi is in far south Mumbai and is a solid hour plus drive to either one of the airport's two terminals. Looking closer, the property is at the end of Marine Drive in the upscale Naraman Point neighborhood, which borders the Kalaba neighborhood. The hotel is connected to its sister property, the Trident Hotel, at both the lobby level and the pool deck level. But when entering the Oberoi, we're first in a small ground floor receiving area where we can catch an elevator that goes up to the full lobby. The lobby, at the base of a 14-story atrium, is bright, open, contemporary, and elegant, dominated by blacks, neutral tones, and deep burgundies and reds. Built the year before the Mandarin Oriental in Singapore, the Oberoi here feels like what the Mandarin and any atrium-style hotel should be, bright and open by day, and intimate and elegant by night. So, you already know this, but this video was in no way, shape, or form sponsored by Oberoi or any affiliated entities. That gives me the ability to give you a true, unbiased opinion in this review. But the channel does have to be funded somehow, and that's where your views, comments, thumbs up, and subscriptions come into play, as they really do help the channel grow. If you'd like to also support me on Patreon, there's a link in the description below. A big thank you in advance for stopping by today. Those who visit the Oberoi are as diverse as the city that it represents, and many choose it for its relatively good value, its incredible food program, and perhaps for a break in the middle of an extended trip. Moments after arriving, I was escorted directly to my room where all check-in procedures took place. We'll check out the room soon, but first let's head to the pool deck. On the right side of the pool is the Trident Hotel, which was built in 1973 and at the time was the tallest building in South Asia. It was a joint venture between Oberoi and Sheridan. Over the years, these two sister properties have also dabbled with Hilton for a bit, but they're now firmly standing on their own. The first Oberoi was opened in the 1930s when the founder, RBM Singh Oberoi, bought two properties. Over the coming decades, he expanded the brand along with Trident and his two sons. There are currently 32 Oberois and 10 Trident properties spread across seven countries. While the Oberois pool is nice, the real looker is actually across at the Trident, which you can also access. Among its many, many accolades, Oberoi has been recently named the best hotel and resort group by Travel and Leisure. I'll note not one of the best, the best. After decades though, this certainly did not happen by accident. There's one mantra at Oberoi that drives everything that they do. The guest is everything. Similar to some other Indian hotel brands, such as Taj, Oberoi have their own dharma. Think of it as a customer service mission statement, which is based on the concept of guest as God. This is interpreted to mean that treating the guest with respect, honoring the guest, is not kinda sorta like, but is equivalent to honoring God. It's a concept and a level of customer service that would frankly be out of the question in much of the world. But it is that very concept which has the world waking up 
to the incredible hotels and hospitalities that are already on offer in India. There are two codes of conduct in their dharma that stood out to me. First is requiring, quote, conduct which puts the customer first, the company second, and the self last. We hear a lot about putting the customer first, but this is the first time and I think only time that I've ever seen a company instructing its staff to explicitly put the company second. It's a pretty incredible concept to actually think about. This is the lobby of the Trident Hotel, which is connected via a small corridor and a shopping gallery to the Oberoi's lobby. As we walk to my room, the second code of conduct was, quote, conduct which demonstrates a two-way communication, accepting constructive debate and dissent while acting fearlessly with conviction. This is something that you can see actually taking place. It's still astonishing to me how I'm really never asked about how my stay was when I check out of a hotel anymore. At Oberoi, not only do they ask, they want to know. They want to talk about it. They want to actually understand the issue no matter how small. Not only that, but they'll also in real time ask guests outright about what they think about certain policies. For my stay, I was upgraded to a beautiful corner room upon arrival, in this case 1051, which is a bit of a misnomer since the 10th floor is actually the lowest guest room floor and just two large levels above the lobby. One last example, when I was checking out of the Oberoi in Bengaluru, the desk agent asked my opinion about the mask policy as it relates to staff, and we had a conversation about it. It wasn't scripted, there was a sincere desire to want to make the best better, to always go that extra mile so to speak. I know it's a different property, but the hotels were so similar in service culture that they felt like they were just one entity. The linens looked basic, but they were plush and luxurious. The rooms have plenty of connectivity and well-labeled switches. As I arrived in the evening, my room was already turned down and had Oberoi's signature weather forecast card at the bedside. A very nice touch. The hotel had its last major renovation following the attacks in 2008 and reopened in 2010. Please don't get me wrong, the rooms are beautiful and well outfitted, but they're just a little bit boring and generic, I think. The minibar was mostly well stocked, but when I arrived there was no coffee machine, which was promptly brought up when I asked for one. Oberoi's founder is known for being incredibly high touch when it comes to development, design, and functionality, and he insists on his fair share of details, such as labeling the light switches, which he believes should never be more difficult to operate than the ones in your own home. Also, the standard walk-in closets which Oberoi has been building since long before they were a thing. Even to the specific shower heads, everything in every hotel was his choice. The bathrooms are well appointed and feature what is becoming one of my favorite new brands, Forest Essentials. Just as Taj does, Oberoi has their own signature fragrance, which is a combination of lime, tulsi, and narangi. Tulsi is holy basil, and narangi is sweet orange. Altogether, it's a perfect amount of freshness and luxury without being astringent like many citrus soaps are.
Last up was the view from the room, which was the low point of the room in general for me. But not just because the view itself is not great, because there's construction outside going on all day and all night, which woke me up both nights. Surely the construction is not the fault of or within the control of the hotel. But what's a hotel primarily for? Sleeping? So yeah, it is a problem. Let's explore a couple of the food and beverage venues at the property. First up is U Bar, which is an Art Deco theme inside and an outdoor patio with a separate bar overlooking what would be a beautiful view of the Arabian Sea on a clear day. Just off of the lobby, you saw the champagne bar before, which is essentially just a lobby bar. There is also an Italian restaurant named Vetro and Enoteca, which is known for their wine pairings and lounge. But my focus and the highlight, I believe, of this entire hotel is Zaya, their Indian restaurant. While they have a full a la carte menu, I came for their impressions menu, which at around $75 a head is not the cheapest option by a long shot, but turned out to be worth every single penny. Starting off with a variety of chutneys and an incredible mangosteen sorbet, known locally as kokum. One thing I appreciate about the tasting menu is that you can choose course by course if you'd like veg or non-veg. I started off non-veg with the charcoal edamame samosa with chili prawns. Next up was the grilled garlic chutney fish, which was spectacular. At this point, I couldn't help but overhear the couple at the table next to me ordering, which is just another example of the level of service here. As they sat down, they were asked if they wanted the same wine the night prior. No, they wanted to change, but something similar. The server thoughtfully rattled off a few options, and they took her suggestion. When she came back to serve the wine, she asked if they had any questions about the menu for food tonight. The couple told her that they just didn't know what to order. The server, without flinching, noted the specific dishes that they had the night prior and asked which was their favorite. From that, she then suggested three new dishes to complement their preferences and asked if they'd again like everything at a medium spice level as they did the night prior. I went veg next and had the black pepper broccoli malai, which honestly, Changed broccoli, I think, for me, forever. Think fragrantly spiced and charred broccoli au gratin. I've personally made this at home twice since I had it, and I will be evolving my own recipe, I suspect, for many years to come. Last but not least was dessert, which was a melange of butterscotch, almond, rose, and cardamom. That was quite the meal, but we're in TV world, so it's already time for breakfast before sunrise the next morning, which would be had at Phoenix, their all-day restaurant which serves a variety of cuisines. Part restaurant and part living room, the space is comfortable and informal and set up to the nines. On offer was a small buffet, along with an extensive a la carte menu. Perhaps the most extensive supplemental menu I think I've ever seen for breakfast, and one of the best as well. For me, breakfast is a true make or break moment for luxury hotels. There's a lot to be said about the effort and details that go into something that is free. Here, Oberoi proves that my delicious dinner at Saya the night before was not just a fluke. The menu was split between Western and Indian options, and the Indian options were further broken down by region. A total of 34 dishes on offer. Here's a selection of what I had during my stay. 
By far, my favorite was the akuri, which was scrambled eggs with turmeric, chili, and coriander, served with some impossibly fluffy bread. Last up, we have the spa and fitness center, which provided a comprehensive selection of equipment. So, overall, I had very high expectations, but within the context of a more or less reasonably priced hotel, and overall those expectations were exceeded. The design is not over the top ornate and gilded like many luxury hotels in the city. Instead, understated with a customer service philosophy with deep roots in elevating the guest experience as much as possible while still doing so discreetly and only when it's welcome. It's a delicate balance. It's just my assumption that in the next five years or so, this property will see its next renovation. And after that, I think the rooms will match the incredible level of service and quality of food. I really do hope that you enjoyed this video, my first of many hotels to feature in India, and I hope you'll join me next time at the Taj Mahal Palace in Mumbai.